Okay, we have been covering a lot of reactions that have been involving oxidation. Oxidation of carbon, basically we're adding bonds to electronegative elements. Now, we're going to talk today about two more oxidation reactions. One is the oxidation of alcohols, and then the following is a reaction called radical halogenation. So, for oxidation of alcohols, in these reactions you will use um, quite a bit the rest of the semester, as well as use a lot of, a lot of these oxidation reactions in Chem 345 as well. But essentially, if you take an alcohol and treat it with a reagent called PCC, and the solvent that's typically used with PCC is dichloromethane, and that's actually quite important you end up getting an aldehyde. We'll get to the structure of PCC in just a, just a moment. If you start with a secondary alcohol, treat it with PCC, you get a ketone. In these reactions, what's happening in this reaction is you're taking a hydrogen off of the oxygen and a hydrogen off the alpha carbon to give you a C double bond O, a carbonyl. If you have a tertiary alcohol, treat it with PCC, dichloromethane. No reaction. Because there is not a hydrogen on the alpha carbon. So keep that in mind. That's one oxidation. The other oxidation of alcohols involves chromic acid. In chromic acid, we just write H2CRO4. Typically, the solvent used is water. Um, if you don't include it, it's fine. But what that does is it takes a primary alcohol to a carboxylic acid. It takes a secondary alcohol to a ketone, and you include water or not, doesn't matter. Water is implied with chromic acid. If you have a tertiary alcohol, Again, there is no reaction because there is no hydrogen on the alpha carbon. So the main difference between PCC and chromic acid is with the reaction of primary alcohols. PCC stops at the aldehyde.
formic acid goes past the aldehyde to give a carboxylic acid. That's the difference between them. Now, what PCC and chromic acid are? PCC stands for pyridinium chlorochromate. And here's one structure of pyridinium chlorochromate. Oops, got one. Should be like that. Another um, structure of pyridinium chlorochromate. Is this salt here? And this is probably the more correct version of it. Chromic acid. like this and both of those actually come from the same molecule chromium trioxide Chromium trioxide is this disgusting red goop. Oh, it's just absolutely disgusting. And if you add water to it and dissolve it in water, what you get is this uh, yellow um, solution. And that yellow, yellowish, greenish solution is chromic acid. But if instead you carefully treat the chromium trioxide with pyridine and hydrochloric acid, you end up with PCC, which is an orange powder. The main difference between these two reagents, quite frankly, is water. PCC is a specially formulated form of chromium trioxide that can be dried and so it can essentially, you can eliminate all water from the process. And the reason why water is so important in this reaction, why it affects it so much, has to do with an equilibrium reaction. We talked about um, 
done briefly last time, which is hydrate formation. In the presence of a catalytic amount of acid or base in water, carbonyls are in equilibrium with the hydrate form. And if we take a look at a hydrate form of, say, an aldehyde, What we end up getting is a molecule with an H on the O and an H on the alpha carbon. And this is what the chromium oxidizes to form carboxylic acid. So if you take an aldehyde, and react it with chromic acid, you end up making a carboxylic acid because it goes through this hydrate intermediate. The reason why ketones are not oxidized any further is they can also undergo this hydrate formation reaction, except here there is not a hydrogen on the alpha carbon. If you were to take a primary alcohol and react it with PCC, but instead of using this typical dichloromethane solvent, if you use water as a solvent, you end up with a carboxylic acid. Because it goes through the aldehyde, which is in equilibrium, with the hydrate, and the hydrate has a hydrogen on the alpha carbon. Okay. Mechanism. And I'm never going to ask what the mechanism of um, oxidation is. So this is just purely for your own reference. So let's do the PCC oxidation, because the, the two of them are very similar to each other. So what you have first is you form the active compound in the oxidation, and that's chromium trioxide. And chromium trioxide is Lewis acidic. It reacts with the oxygen of the alcohol and then some proton transfers. I'm going to use pyridine as my base. Now this group right here is actually a leaving group.
And what you can do is you can do an elimination. I'm going to use the O minus from this chromium to grab that H. These electrons are going to go between the oxygen and the carbon, and that's going to kick these electrons up onto the chromium. giving you this species here. Okay. So, You need to make an aldehyde. Use PCC. If you need to make a carboxylic acid, use chromic acid. If you need to make a ketone, Either one. You just have to start with a secondary alcohol. And that's it. Now, the rest of the time, I want to use this to talk about radical halogenations. And in this reaction, we're going to actually react an alkane with halogens. Normally, Alkanes throughout the semester have been pretty unreactive and not wanting to do pretty much anything. But turns out alkanes can react with halogens. So just to kind of give you an example, and we're going to typically using chlorine and bromine. Yes, you can do halogenation with, with um, fluorine. Um, iodine's quite a bit harder to do and so isn't used. Fluorine, on the other hand, is um, usually ends up, when you're reacting flora, fluorine with um, an alkane, you usually end up with an explosion. So we're not going to worry about that. We're going to worry about chlorine and bromine. So say you had propane, and you expose it to chlorine gas, and then you shine light. H nu is the abbreviation for light get a mixture of products where we're replacing a hydrogen with a chlorine. And here are the um, product ratios that's often get, given, the major product being the more substituted one. Now if we went with 2-methyl propane and halogenate that, The major product is this one, well, the chlorine goes on the less substituted side. We can do the same reactions with bromine, but you'll notice with bromine, you get a far better selectivity. and a far more predictable reaction.
bromination is far more selective than chlorination is. Chlorination can be a bit unpredictable. So, to explain this, let's take a look at the mechanism. Now, the mechanisms are pretty much the same. They are a part of a radical chain reaction. Very similar to the um, reaction involving HBr and peroxides. We have light, and what light does is it breaks the halogen-halogen bond, which is a weak bond. In this first step, we're starting with zero radicals going to two radicals. It's initiation. And then what the radical does is it pulls off a hydrogen. to give a carbon radical, an HBr. And then this carbon, and this start, we start with a radical, make a new radical. This is what's called propagation. And then this radical finds another molecule of bromine and reacts. to form the product, plus another radical. This is also a propagation step. In radical chain reactions, there's also steps called termination. That's where you take two radicals and combine them together, like one example might be this. So we have two roots to generate the product. We have a root going into propagation and a root goes through a termination. Termination is very, very rare. Very little product is actually generated in termination step. That's because essentially radicals are highly reactive. And chances of two radicals coming together at the same time are very rare. Sort of like if we think of um, a lion is the most ferocious um, land um, animal, and a shark is a ferocious um, sea animal. Yes, they are both ferocious, very hungry, yet we won't see them try to eat each other because, well, they're never around each other. Yeah, poor analogy. It's the best I can do. It's Sunday. So, anyhow. Here's the mechanism. Mechanism for chlorination is the exact same, except instead of BRs, you have CLs.
So why the, why is there such a difference in the selectivity between bromine and chlorine? For that, we'll have to get into the thermodynamics of the reaction. We have to look at bond dissociation energies. This is the, these are the energies that it's gained or lost when making or breaking bonds. And these are given in kilojoules per mole at 25 degrees Celsius. And this is a couple of things like a hydrogen attached to a methyl group that has a bond dissociation of 439 kilojoules per mole. Hydrogen attached to an ethyl group, 423. 412 is attached to a secondary carbon. It's attached to a tertiary carbon, 404. And I don't expect you to memorize these numbers. I do expect you to know patterns. And if it's attached to a carbon attached to the benzene ring, 378. What we see is that the more substituted the carbon is, the easier it is to break that bond. That's the pattern I want you to go. A hydrogen attached to a tertiary carbon is easier to pull off then a hydrogen attached to a secondary carbon, and so on and so forth. Also, take a look at um, bonds involving halogens. What you see is typically there's not much of a difference on the substitution of the carbon. So slight difference when it comes to secondary bromides, but not much. Lastly, just got some other numbers to show up. HCl, 431, HBr, 368, CLCL, 239, BrBr, 190. Okay, what I want you to recognize from these numbers is a carbon chlorine bond is stronger than a carbon bromine bond. A bromine bromine bond is weaker than a chlorine chlorine bond is. A hydrogen chlorine bond is stronger than a hydrogen bromine bond. And when you're using a table and bond association energies and figuring out, it's important to realize that when you make a bond, energy is released. Energy is given off. So you use these numbers only negative. So if you make any of these bonds, it's negative. In order to break a bond, energy is added to the system to break that bond. And so you use positive values of this. Okay. Now, it's time to talk about how this relates to the mechanism. And for the mechanism, we're going to really focus on the most important parts, the reoccurring parts of the mechanism, and that's the propagation steps.
So, take chlorine, reacts with this. get a primary radical. <coughs> the energetics of the system right here we have to break a CH bond so we use 423. You have to add that much energy into it. That's a hydrogen attached to a primary carbon. Hydrogen attached to a primary carbon, 423. But at the same time we're breaking the CH bond, we are making an HCl bond. And that gives off 431 kilojoules more. The net result of this step is you get a 12 kilojoule per mole. It's minus 12 kilojoules per mole. That means it's giving off energy. This is exothermic. Now, if we have it pull off the tertiary hydrogen instead, we break the CH bond. When we break the CH bond, it's off the tertiary carbon, so that's 404. And we're still making an HCl, that's 431. And that's negative since we're making that bond. And so we get a minus 27 kilojoules per mole. net exothermic. So in both cases, in what's determining where the chlorine goes, the first case, it's exothermic. It's giving off energy. It's a favorable process. Now let's take a look at bromination. We have to break the CH bond. Again, that's going to be 423. Positive. But we are going to make the HBr bond. That's minus 368. And if we subtract these two, we get plus 55 kilojoules per mole. This reaction is endothermic, meaning in order to get it to go, we need to keep pumping in a lot of energy to get this to go. Do the tertiary case.
to break the CH bond, I have to add 404 to make the HBr bond. We get out minus 368. So we get plus 36 kilojoules per mole. This too is endothermic. So the difference between HCl and HBr is well, the chlorination and bromination, I should say, is chlorination is an exothermic reaction. Bromination is an endothermic reaction. So, where that would look like in terms of an energy diagram. Let's put the two side by side. See L dot plus this alkane is an exothermic reaction. So it looks like that. Br dot plus the alkane. It's an endothermic reaction. Now, there is something called Hammond's postulate. The rate of both reactions is really dependent on the transition state. In Hammond's postulate, says that you can approximate the transition state closest to the stable molecule in energy to it. So this is what's called an early transition state, where the transition state is closest in energy to the starting materials. So therefore, the rate of the reaction is going to be heavily dependent on the starting materials. This is what's referred to as a late transition state. where it looks, it's closer in energy to the products. In this case, the transition state is heavily influenced by the structure of the products. Here, in this case, this radical, the tertiary radical, is more stable than the primary radical. Therefore, the activation barrier is lower for the tertiary carbon than the primary. And so you'd get late transition states in endothermic reactions, or endothermic steps, I should say, and you get early transition states for exothermic steps. And so here, this is heavily influenced by the starting material, 
And what influences this particular thing is has to do with numbers. To get to this molecule, there are nine hydrogens you can pull off. To get to this molecule, there's only one hydrogen. So you have a nine to one ratio, making it much more likely that you'll pull off a primary versus a tertiary. Here's another way of thinking about it. A chlorine radical is much more reactive than a bromine radical is. So when it hits a molecule, it's much more likely to react. A bromine radical is much more stable, meaning it's going to hit a molecule, and since it's an endothermic reaction, chances are it's just going to bounce off. It's going to keep hitting the molecule until it finds the one that absolutely wants to take off and then take that off in the process. So, now if we wanted to keep on doing these reactions and finish the steps on it, you'll find that, that this has a net, both reactions are net, net exothermic. Both reactions are favorable, but it's this initial step, the formation of the carbon radical, that governs where the halogen goes. I mean by that, let's take a look at um, this reaction right here and keep on going. So I'm going to copy this. Drag it to a new screen. And then if we were to continue on and figure out the net result of this reaction, we are going to make a carbon bromine bond into a tertiary carbon, that's 304 kilojoules per mole. And we are going to break the bromine-bromine bond that's going to take 190 in. And if we do the math, get minus 78 kilojoules per mole. So overall, the reaction is indeed exothermic. But the rate, but the, the step that determines where the bromine goes, which hydrogen is pulled off, that step right there is endothermic. That's the difference between chlorination and bromination. Even though they both have net exothermic reactions, bromination's first step is endothermic. So how to use this in a reaction? What I want you to remember is bromination
forms places the DR. Where the most stable radical is. So here, tertiary radicals are the most stable radicals. So that would place the bromine there. Chlorination is unpredictable. It's best not to use it ever. Molecule like this is quite fast and would put the bromine right here. Mainly because this radical is resin stabilized. And that's all I got. We'll pick this up on Wednesday.